ahead. Okay, I'd like to call the Committee of the Whole Budget Meeting on October 7th, 2020 to order. Good evening, everyone. My name is Adam Russell, Councillor and Chair of Committee of the Whole Budget Meeting. We are meeting electronically through Zoom, and this is our first Committee of the Whole Budget Meeting during this declared emergency period. Members of the public may observe the proceedings by accessing the live webcast at our YouTube channel. I will ask our town clerk uh, to complete a roll call of councils that we may confer in quorum. Thank Julie, you. please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Easton. Here. Councillor Russell. Here. Councillor Pachariva. Present. Councillor McPherson. Here. Councillor McClick. Here. Councillor Timmers. Here. <clears throat> Councillor Reimer. Here. Councillor Regima. Here. And Councillor Bernay is Mark Thompson. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, in addition, I would like to take a moment to welcome the staff we have joining us today electronically. Um, the Chief Administrative Officer, Mike Kirkopoulos, Finance Treasurer, Terry Trawalla, Director of Planning and Development, Kathleen Dale, Director of Community Services, Shannon McKay, Fire Chief, Chief Greg Hudson, uh, Economic Development Officer, Paul Diani, Director of Public Works, Dave Graham, our library CEO, uh, Julie Andrews. And moderating and clerking the meeting uh, today, we have our town clerk, Julie Kirkalos. And of course, we have our IT staff helping us and supporting us through all of our endeavors. As this is a virtual meeting, uh, I will ask that we follow some procedures during this electronic meeting. Should there be a connection or a service disruption for the chair or if quorum is lost, the chair and or the clerk will call a 10 minute recess to reconnect and to regain quorum. If quorum is lost, the meeting will be adjourned. If connection is lost from the chair, the clerk will ask those in attendance to wait up to 10 minutes to provide the chair time to reconnect and resume the meeting. Otherwise, after that time frame, the vice chair, Councillor Pachariva, will resume the meeting and the chair will re until the chair is reconnected and resume his role. Each member of council who wishes to speak, please use the raise hand feature on your video call and the clerk will track our speakers list today and then invite you to speak when I open it up for comments or questions. Also, when I finish reading a motion and announce the mover, the clerk will then call out the vote by reading each member of council's name out loud. Please remember to take yourselves off mute during this portion of the meeting so that you can confirm if you support or oppose. Also, when not speaking, please remember to keep yourselves on mute. Declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest from anyone? Seeing none, do members have any amendments in the order of the agenda? Seeing none. We have no statutory public meetings and we also have no delegations. We have no consent agenda items. So we are now on to our regular agenda and we are now considering item 8.1, report FN 10-20-2021, budget process and calendar. Do members of council have any questions or comments? I see no questions or comments. So there being no further discussion, I have a motion moved by Councillor Rent Gemma. to receive and file the 2021 budget process and calendar report FN 1020. I will now ask the clerk to call out the vote. Thank you, please remove your mics off of mute while I call your names. And Councillor Brunet is Mark Thompson. Councillor McPherson. Yes. Councillor McClick. Yes. Councillor Pachariva. Yes. Councillor Reimer. Yes. Councillor Regima. Yes. Councillor Russell. Yes. Councillor Timmers. Yes. Mary Easton. Support. And that carries. Okay, we are now considering item 8.2, the capital forecast introductory meeting. Uh, if you indulge me a, a few minutes, I'm just going to give us a, a brief little intro, uh, and then I will turn it over to our CAO. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of Council, staff, and residents of the Town of Lincoln. Tonight marks the beginning of the public presentation and discussion of the 2021 capital and operational budget. Traditionally, this is an exciting and lively process, a culmination of years of data, months of planning and analyzing by staff, and days and hours of discussion before landing on an approval of the year's activities ahead. 
I'm sure the same experience was repeated in the years prior to my term of council, but this year is different. This year, staff and council are faced with creating a plan without knowing where the road ahead will bend. We face building a budget against the landscape of a global pandemic, which has caused ripples and waves of uncertainty throughout our community. We start these discussions in what could be the beginning of a second wave, and as a result, ensures that the road ahead must be traveled with caution. Over the last six months, COVID has impacted each and every one of us. Some of us have lost family and friends. Some have lost jobs or have had a reduction in their income. But all of us have lost some freedom as we make sacrifices to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities. As we wade through the planning for 2021, it is acutely important to understand the financial reality of our residents so that we can ensure that the budget is a reflection of their needs. And in doing so, we focus on those who have been impacted by COVID restrictions the most and find themselves in a vulnerable state. I will make note of a few startling facts before we get going that we should all heed. Since the establishment of the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit or the CERB, in mid-March, 3.5 million Ontarians have applied for assistance, which is roughly 32% of the adult population. That is roughly a third of working age residents who have seen their income impacted or reduced. We need to be mindful of this number and understand how it impacts our Lincoln families. On Monday, we heard the mayor state that the current economy will unleash a reckoning on household debt until our health status writes itself. She followed it up by acknowledging that there are many in crisis and we can all help make a difference to help them. Council Rent Gemma was very poignant when she mentioned that women are disproportionately affected and are expected to remain disproportionately affected economically because of COVID-19. And that our vulnerable populations are something we need to keep top of mind in all the decisions we make. Here in Lincoln, as of 2016, years before COVID, we had nearly 800 single parent families or nearly 12% according to census. Of those 600 were led by single females and 185 were led by single males. Pre-COVID census indicated that 1,655 residents were deemed low income or roughly 7% of our total population. Additionally, 21% of our roughly 24,000 residents are over the age of 65 and likely on a fixed income. These people are our most vulnerable. These are the people we need to keep in mind when we are drafting and evaluating our budget. It is not the 80% of the population that can absorb an increase in the levy and see their taxes rise without much thought. It is the 15 to 20% on the edge, the group that is often marginalized and because of COVID in a situation where they find themselves vulnerable. That is who we need to focus on. That is who we need to remember. This town and our staff have continually shown that they are capable of great things and extreme acts of kindness and empathy. And while we all hope and expect that the impacts of COVID are short lived and that the forthcoming difficult discussions regarding budget will be temporary, we need to ensure that we deliver a budget that is both fulsome and reflective of the needs of our residents. In the two years I've been on council, I cannot emphasize enough how proud I am to work with the people who genuinely care about doing what is best for our community and continually strive to go above and beyond to deliver results. We heard from Regional Councilor Foster on Monday that the region is being very conservative and pragmatic in their budget planning. We need to do the same. Lincoln has become a leader amongst our local area municipalities in multiple areas. We need to be sure that we set the bar high at the end of budget 2021. We need to remember those independent business owners, those single moms and dads, and everyone in our community that is struggling when they evaluate every project and give our final approval. This will likely be the most important and impactful budget that any of us will be part of during our tenure. So now, as I turn it over to the CAO and staff, let us begin. Mr. Kokopoulos, I believe you have a presentation. Through you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for your uh, introductory comments. I, I also have a few uh, to make, and, and some of those were articulated in the uh, in the email that I sent Council, but I think it's important that uh, we also highlight them uh, again for those that, uh, that may be watching, that may be listening. So tonight's presentation, uh, as we said earlier today, um, really is an introduction to the 2021 budget process. Uh, and in that presentation, we will be setting the guiding principles that staff will follow as we build out the budget. Uh, committee tonight is our primary audience as we look at this budget, but I think it goes without saying that residents at home uh, are also an audience that we are speaking to. And I think some of your comments, uh, you know, were also in that 
uh, in that particular vein. Uh, what we do want to do is, I think, convey, like you did, the seriousness of uh, the budget process uh, and what we're doing in the budget process, but also to reassure both council uh, and uh, our residents that, uh, that staff are working through a very detailed and professional uh, process. I think one of the themes that you'll see strong through this presentation is the respectful management of tax dollars, something that we always look to do. Uh, it is important, I think, as, as you said, and, and many members of council have said in the climate we're in, uh, that we do remind uh, our community about the high quality services we deliver and the importance of those services that we are delivering. Uh, there will be significant community and council engagement throughout the process. And so I look forward to uh, taking you through this. Uh, the senior leadership team also has a role to play in all of uh, in our presentation. Uh, and you'll hear from each of them as well at various points in the presentation. So I'm just gonna pull it up and we will um, start So in terms of what we're going to cover tonight, so you have to be a little patient with us. We're not in sync. Paul's driving, but I'm speaking and for a bit here. Uh, so a little bit about what we're discussing today. Um, and I think we heard, uh, we heard council, we heard some of the suggestions about how to make the process a better, a little bit more streamlined. Uh, so we are going to talk a little bit about uh, things uh, that focus on the economic and political landscape, uh, a little bit of a budget outlook. Uh, budget schedule, which council just approved, uh, the guiding principles, a little bit about process, uh, the impact of budget decisions. Uh, and we do want to validate what we heard during our meetings over the last two weeks uh, with members of council uh, regarding the 10 year capital forecast. So a little bit of, of kind of what we're facing right now. Uh, and I think uh, some of this uh, council's heard about in the past before some of this uh, you highlighted in your comments, uh, Chair Russell, but uh, COVID's had a profound impact uh, on everyone. Um, and so our 2021 budget decisions really uh, are gonna be critical. Uh, I've always said, once we get through 2020 in the immediate emergency, 2021 becomes a very important year for, year for us. What we are hearing from both uh, the federal and provincial governments though, is that 2021 really is a period of adaptation uh, so adapting to the current realities. We're in a second wave. We're likely going to be in a second wave of this pandemic uh, into 2021. Uh, and while we believe and uh, I think have faith that recovery starts in 2021, it really will be 2022 when we start seeing that recovery uh, and a rebounding of the economy from the perspective of jobs and growth. So Lincoln has a part to play uh, in this recovery. I think uh, councils heard that. We've heard that when the Construction Association and others reach out to us about the importance of continuing to tender capital works and making sure that residents from our community and across Niagara have jobs. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, it goes without saying the importance that Lincoln plays in that recovery. So infrastructure spending, uh, as well as implementing uh, our capital work plan in 2021 and beyond. Uh, one of the things that um, we've talked about, uh, and I think that Mr. Deany has shared with you, and we've heard directly from the minister, is that tourism uh, will be a slower recovery. Uh, what we'll see likely in terms of the confidence people feel and the safety they feel more than anything uh, in that broad-based uh, tourism industry in terms of flying and traveling uh, likely is, is something uh, that takes us into 2024 and 2025. Uh, and so uh, that's also something to be cognizant of because it is an economic driver for our community. Uh, so the way forward, um, one of the things early on in the process when we were looking at recovery uh, and responding to COVID that we uh, talked to council about and the council supported and endorsed was a, a plan that looked at recovery, renewal and growth as some of those key tenants. Uh, so what does this mean? Uh, again, I think uh, as I highlighted in my introductory comments, uh, respectfully managing taxpayer dollars is, is absolutely uh, critical ensuring affordability for our community. We're hearing that loud and clear. Uh, supporting our business stakeholders, something else we're hearing uh, constantly. How do we support them? How do we be a bit more nimble? How do we look at uh, things that councils uh, asked us to look at, uh, whether they be more efficient processing, technology, the deliver of high quality services, 
that our residents have come to expect. I think that's something important. Uh, for every challenge we deal with in terms of affordability, we balance on the other side, delivering high quality services and, and the importance of service delivery. So we are, um, efficiencies is always something we're thinking, breathing, trying to incorporate into our work. And I think in, in some ways, these are some highlights here that uh, I, I hope uh, council sees as uh, just a, a start into that efficiency lens, uh, by no means are, are these exhaustive and there will be more, but a recent collective bargaining agreement, uh, which looked at um, increases and the importance of increases earlier on in that agreement, uh, moving towards more paperless, um, a paperless environment, uh, streamlining some of our application processes, again, innovation uh, in terms of digital service delivery uh, and the continuation and looking at shared services. So goals of uh, our presentation tonight, uh, do a little bit of information sharing with council on the process, a little bit about schedule uh, so that council uh, can see where we're at in the schedule. We heard some updates from regional Councillor Foster in terms of the region's budget and looking at January or February for overall approval. Uh, and so uh, typically we have uh, always sought to find uh, approval of our budget uh, by the end of the year, uh, definitely on the capital side that helps us. Uh, and so I think we're gonna continue to try to work to having capital as, as wrapped up as we can by year's end uh, and if possible operating as well, but not knowing what the landscape looks like for the next few months. Uh, we do want to be nimble enough to potentially change, but nothing that we're going into saying that it has to be January uh, or, or later. Communication to residents. Um, so there is that, that kind of balance we seek uh, to have uh, in terms of maintaining and improving services. Uh, what that looks like. I mean, we opened up a phenomenal skate park and pump track this weekend. Uh, it, is, it is being used um, extensively uh, sometimes too much. Uh, and so I think uh, residents have come to express service, uh, have come to expect services like that. Um, at the same time though, you know, this year more than ever, respecting taxpayer uh, affordability will also be front of mind. So tonight our audience, I think as we said, uh, of course is council, uh, but there are other stakeholders throughout Lincoln and, and you'll, we'll talk a little bit more about engagement uh, later in the presentation. <clears throat> so again, just a little bit of a, uh, Budget schedule, you saw this in the previous report, so I won't spend a lot of time here. This is fluid and nimble uh, and definitely something we can uh, react to as needed. So uh, a few of the guiding principles. Uh, I, I am not gonna spend a ton of time on guiding principles, uh, maybe where we have in the years past, because these are things that we've adopted, um, I would say over the last uh, five to six years, uh, and, and they really haven't changed. Um, but I think important to once again, put in front of council, uh, affordability, quality of life, remain important tenants to our residents and businesses. Uh, the challenge that we put to ourselves to deliver high quality programming, and to do it in the best possible way. Council Russell, you had highlighted, we are a leader in Niagara. I think that's something we all take pride in and want to see continue. Uh, but we also understand where possible, minimal adjustments to property taxes in this landscape uh, is also something that we keep at the forefront of our mind. Uh, a long-term approach. So looking at long-term, our decisions uh, don't just live on for one year, two years, four years. Uh, some of our decisions on the capital and facility side are 40 and 50 year decisions in terms of the life cycle and lifespan of some of these uh, infrastructure works. Uh, we wanna make sure where possible, we're maintaining uh, predictable revenue streams this year moving forward, maybe a very challenging year on that till we get at least to the latter part of the year. Uh, but looking at our predictable and sustainable revenue streams and then building in flexibility and contingencies uh, as priorities and opportunities arise. Uh, as I said, we're going to be speaking a little bit more uh, and Mr. Deani, uh, who's picking up the, uh, the slack on, on the communications front since COVID hit and since uh, the departure of our previous communications lead. Uh, we'll take you a little bit through some of the uh, new and, and I'd say a little innovative ways we're gonna try to do some community consultation and COVID uh, affords us that opportunity in, in, in more of a virtual sense. Uh, promoting program efficiency and effectiveness, something again that we continue to look at. Uh, this new digital delivery has allowed us to do some, some things there. Uh, definitely on the planning side for sure. 
and then establishing linkages, establishing linkages to our organizational goals. We still keep those at the forefront of what we're doing, looking back, seeing those connections. So the welcoming, connected, vibrant, and resilient uh, priorities. So building a budget, I think this slide um, in a lot of ways, uh, while, be, while, while introductory in some senses, I think really draws that comparison to what we hear from members of council often, and that is uh, running a municipality uh, in some ways um, mimics some of the decision-making thought process we hear uh, in running our own households. Uh, we weigh needs versus available funds. I mean, that's really as simple as it is sometimes, uh, considering what we can afford uh, and what that cost is to taxpayers. Uh, and this applies to operating and capital. So as a municipality, we need to maintain services, you know, do repairs, uh, we need supplies, insurance, no different than the monthly bills we see uh, at home, daycare, utilities, rent, mortgage, groceries, insurance. Uh, we have repairs at home, roof or the windows or the furnace or appliances. No different uh, on the asset management side. We had roads and infrastructure and parks and facilities and fleet we need to take care of. And, and on both sides, we want to plan for the future. At home, we want to you know, plan for the new house or our ESPs or what our retirement looks like. Here at, at our organization and every municipality, you know, we have business, uh, we have modernizing services, we have more residents. So what is the planning that needs to happen for the future? So a little bit about our budget process and what's it look like. Um, phase one is that prepare phase. Uh, and so uh, I think we've said to council all along, uh, all throughout the year, we're looking at budgets and we're looking at what our budget's gonna look like next year uh, and what's required. Uh, there are estimates uh, and data we put uh, into those decision-making matrices. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, it does allow us to start preparing uh, for what's to come. We're looking at fiscal issues, we're looking at forecasts, guidelines, uh, and the background information required. Phase two is, is really that engage piece. Uh, and you heard us talk a little bit about that. Phase three is really staff starting to kind of put their mind around with council, evaluating budget guidelines, looking at our master plans, our studies, resident input, uh, meeting with council, hearing from you what your priorities are, and, and council, you know, is very much involved in that development and in that engage phase. Uh, the consolidation thing, kind of what the, the phase we're going through right now. Uh, so staff are working together across departments uh, and you'll hear from a number of uh, our department heads shortly about how that integration looks, how that happens. Uh, and then it's that prioritization uh, and finalizing of both capital and operating that happens afterwards. And at the end, it's it's inform, engage, debate, and approve. Uh, and so, well, that's a mouthful. Uh, really, that's council doing what council does in terms of engaging on the budget, debating where appropriate, approving, highlighting, and overlaying the priorities that you hear, uh, and ultimately following that, it's communicating the approved budget to the community uh, so that they're aware of where we're making investments. <clears throat> So I think oftentimes we're, we're talking about um, trends. We're talking about, uh, you know, what, what what's the past look like? What are future growth projections? These are all things that we're looking at and taking into account. A few key points for council to have here, uh, I think uh, in terms of taking away where we're at, uh, I believe it was Councillor uh, Patrick Rebar, maybe Councillor McPherson, and I apologize if I've gotten that wrong, that asked about how many, or Mayor Easton, uh, how much of our property taxes have been paid. So 89% of people in 2020, uh, while in COVID, still uh, found a way to pay property taxes. Uh, we do have a healthy reserve and reserve fund balance, which is often an indicator of one's financial health. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, but we are at 74%. Uh, that is some, uh, the Niagara average is a little over 50%, uh, and we'll get to that later. But we are a very healthy community in terms of our financial wherewithal and our financial considerations. And so our reserve and reserve funds sit at 74% of revenues. Uh, and our CP and the CPI as a whole across uh, Ontario for 2020 is at 1.9. Oftentimes uh, we look to that as a guideline in terms of budget, uh, in terms of how prices are increasing. Although I think there is such a shortage of product we're seeing on the construction side, a, a, a much, much higher increase in that uh, construction price index, but our consumer price index here sits at 1.9 right now. 
So this slide's a little bit about residential growth projections, a uh, little bit of a detailed slide. Uh, one of the things we promised council and it will be coming uh, at our next meeting uh, is to start to look at growth uh, and to start to look at what growth means from a, uh, a revenue standpoint, what it means from an expenditure standpoint, I think in some ways more importantly so that we can overlay decisions and when money is coming in. Uh, I'll take council, I think, to, to really the last column and maybe both the five-year average and 10-year average where you see the number of new units coming uh, to our community. One of the comments I'll make is that the region is going through a, an exercise right now. Uh, we don't know the end result of that exercise, but there will be an apportionment of growth to every municipality. Uh, some of that we control, some of that we don't. Uh, some of that is just geography and uh, location. Uh, but these are numbers that I think council can expect uh, both over the next five years and over the next 10 years. Uh, this is the non-residential growth projection. So our uh, industrial, commercial, institutional growth. Uh, and so we are seeing growth over the next number of years, uh, definitely more growth than we've seen in, in 2020 so far. So this is a good indicator. It's a steady pace for where we're at. Uh, and uh, what we always want to do is have a diverse uh, type of growth. Uh, the best growth is one that uh, sees residential growth, but also sees commercial, industrial, and institutional. And I think as we all know, uh, on the commercial side, commercial growth is going to look a little bit different, potentially coming out of COVID. <clears throat> so this is a slide um, that, that came from a recent regional council report. Uh, regional council had um, uh, asked KPMG to look at a study uh, of the region and uh, long-term borrowing levels across the region. Uh, and so we've just shared that slide with council. Uh, we've underlined Lincoln. Uh, we are the fourth lowest uh, in all of Niagara when it comes to debt. Uh, and I think that's an important slide. Um, oftentimes, I think people look at strategic long-term borrowing and wonder, how are we doing? Or how do we stack up to others? Or is this an, a, a smart, appropriate way to invest in certain infrastructure? Uh, and, and I think my answer has always been, uh, yes, uh, simply, you know, yes, it is. I think strategically, though, uh, looking at uh, debentures and looking at long-term borrowing when rates are low is, is the appropriate methodology and approach. So, you know, pretty simple. Lincoln is doing very well compared to other uh, local area municipalities. Uh, there are a few that are probably doing slightly better with us, but they are by no means growing at our at our pace uh, or uh, or our size. Uh, and so when you look at Niagara-on-the-Lake, uh, which has very little growth happening, you look uh, similarly at Wayne Fleet and Thorold. Uh, those are the only ones that, I would, that, that are ahead of us or beneath us in this case. Um, and so uh, that is a positive trend. Uh, our debt per household, again, is extremely low. Uh, and so I think this is an important slide. Uh, I'm emphasizing its importance because we often spend a lot of time talking about debt. We will share for council, and I know Councillor Pachuriva has asked for it in the past, as have other councillors, what's coming off and what's going on um, in terms of which projects are falling off. But again, I, I highlight for council where we're at relative to a lot of uh, your comparator municipalities. Um, a lot of our comparator municipalities um, of all sizes, uh, so you can see where we're at on a per per capita household uh, debt per household level. So again, um, reserve and reserve fund balances. Uh, I, I talked about this earlier, but we're at 74%. Here is a look at our reserve and reserve funds, uh, as well as our discretionary and obligatory reserves. Uh, you see the number increasing. So we are doing a good job of putting away the necessary monies that are coming in. Some of these are coming in through development charges and other sources, but we are at 74% uh, of our revenue, whereas the rest of Niagara is at 54%. So another positive indicator of where we're at and something that I think as staff and as council, you will expect us to look at this as we come back to you for funding options for the capital works you wanna get done. So next part of the budget process, as we said, uh, really is, is looking at the various financial reviews. We're going to be in front of you on a number of different occasions talking about our year-end forecast. We're having a 2019 financial statement workshop uh, and our audited financial statements where KPMG, our auditors, will be in. That's happening in November. 
work's currently underway for that. Uh, later in October, we're doing a water and wastewater uh, rate workshop. And of course, at our next meeting, we will be back with you uh, on the 10-year capital forecast uh, with those council revisions uh, that I think we've heard and taken away for council consideration. As well, you'll see the first item there. Uh, this is the safe restart application. Uh, we brought a report to council uh, where we highlighted the monies we had already received from the federal and provincial governments, highlighting that we qualify for more dollars, but we would be required to fill out an application. I will tell council in that application, one of the key requirements is looking at uh, efficiencies and how we're efficiently managing our organization so that we can qualify for that second piece. And so there is a big element of that that we will be speaking to as well. So a little bit around our proposed engagement activities. Uh, I'm going to turn the floor over uh, to Paul on this particular one uh, to talk a little bit about uh, about some of the ideas uh, that we've come up with collectively. Uh, thank you, Mr. CEO, and, and good evening to Council. Uh, as as uh, the CEO said at the start of the presentation tonight, uh, we are looking for some extensive engagement with our, our community throughout this budget process. Uh, we obviously feel that the input that we get from our, our community is, is very valuable. Uh, and obviously COVID and, and the, the rise of, of virtual uh, in teleconferencing and virtual engagement, engagement uh, really provides us with some opportunities to engage our community. So both we're looking at some, some you know, new age engagement, uh, you know, high tech engagement, but also we're looking potentially at some, uh, some old school engagement as well. So social media campaign to, to educate our residents on the process and property taxes. Uh, as mentioned, a potential virtual open house to discuss the budget and receive community input. A survey to learn residents' priorities and understanding of the budget and to convey town services. Uh, again, you know, the new, using uh, new age technology and online survey, but we're also investigating uh, and seeing whether it's possible to uh, do uh, a mailed in survey as well. So we're investigating that. Uh, in addition, really building out uh, on our web page uh, a lot more information on the budget process uh, to provide information about how you know, the budget works, what the process is. Uh, some of the cost breakdowns uh, uh, to city services and, and of course a breakdown of the property tax uh, dollar as well. Uh, in addition, this really goes in, uh, in line with the, the first point, uh, a fun short YouTube video explaining the budget and, and really promoting the survey. So uh, these are some proposed engagement, uh, engagement activities for the community. Uh, we look forward to coming back with some, some, some more details and some more um, ideas in terms of how we can do that, but uh, really looking forward to engaging our, our community uh, throughout this budget process. Thank you, Mike. So th thanks, Paul. Uh, I mean, reason we've got this slide here, I think when we talk about develop, um, council and, and staff spend a considerable amount of time talking about what are our priority objectives uh, and what they mean. Um, and when I think when you look at all of these and the particular elements in it, uh, our decisions are tied back to other things that we've been talking about. I think I want to, and I know council understands this, um, but I think it's important to just highlight that when we come up with a priority objectives, council comes up with them and we co-create these, uh, and then we go forward and start building uh, budgets and looking at the various work plans and documents. Um, all of this comes together. Data is an incredibly important part of what we do. Uh, and so I, I wanted to highlight that for council. So this next slide, uh, albeit busy intentionally, uh, it really speaks to my previous comment, and that is there are a number of studies that are uh, incredibly important to what we do. Uh, you see a few here. This is just a snapshot of the tens of studies that we've got uh, that are informing our capital budget discussion. Uh, we were playing a considerable amount of catch up in terms of having guiding documents and, and comprehensive documents that uh, that are inputs into our decision making. And so I'm gonna ask um, Shannon, Dave, Greg, and, and Kathleen, just to make some very brief comments around uh, the thought process and, and what goes into the decision making within their, within their own respective teams. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so I will start with community services and, and thank you all for allowing me a few moments to speak. Um, as Mike said, making our decisions based on evidence in data is, is extremely important to us as staff. Uh, we look at the tools that exist, the strategies that exist, the plans that exist, 
for us in community services, as you know, and, and as many of our residents will also know, we completed our first, uh, first ever comprehensive parks, recreation and culture master plan last year. And we've been able to go through that extensively, carefully um, and, and considerately and align a lot of our, our, our asks to the priorities and the timing that were identified in those plans, which identified needs and gaps. We've also taken a, a very close look at the facilities audit and life cycle cost study that was completed for the town back in 2012, and that was a 10 year study. Um, so we've looked at that, uh, especially on the asset management side. And we've been able to look at other um, uh, secondary and complementary studies, such as our accessibility audits that happen in our facilities and in our spaces. So as we go through uh, the budget process, these are critical and um, imperative guiding documents that, that we look to, to support the decisions and provide the, the data and the evidence uh, for our decisions. We also look at timing and certainly given um, the pandemic that we are in and still in, having a, an environmental awareness of not only the community groups and those we serve, but also what, what is happening around us to those groups and how they are impacted. So those are the, the, the critical components for us in, in community services. Dave? Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, <clears throat> through you, uh, Chair Russell. So in terms of uh, public works, when we are populating and updating uh, the capital forecast. Uh, we rely on a number of guiding plans and studies, uh, such as the town's asset management plan, uh, master plans, and various infrastructure condition assessment studies to, um, to ultimately ensure that the town is investing on our highest priority infrastructure needs. Um, <clears throat> it's also important to note that most of our core capital infrastructure project needs and the uh, related service levels are, are regulated by provincial legislation, you know, such as the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, the minimum maintenance standards. So <clears throat> it's important that our capital forecasts and timing of those core infrastructure projects also needs to be reflective of, ins of ensuring compliance to the provincial legislation around those services. So we do build that into the capital forecast as well when we're looking at timing of our projects. Um, when we uh, when we look at updating the capital forecast for our road related projects, uh, staff we we use our asset management plan uh, recommendations from the most recent road needs study update that is available, and we also rely heavily on the transportation master plan and the active transportation uh, strategy and those recommendations to give you a sense of water and wastewater capital projects and how we um, look at populating and updating those in the capital forecast. In terms, of the, in terms of our water capital projects, we really rely on our DWQMS infrastructure needs um, plan. And that really is our guiding document for our, how we look at um, the forecast for our, our water system uh, replacement needs. In terms of our wastewater uh, capital projects that you see in the in the capital forecast, those are primarily uh, driven by the asset management plan, and, and as well we have condition assessments on all the sewers, and they are prioritized, and um, we follow a prioritized plan for that as well. Um, when you look at the capital forecast and for the bridges and our large culverts, again. We, we update that plan based on our asset management strategies. And with our bridges and culverts, we have condition assessment inspections that are done every two years. So we, we keep the plan updated on, on all those recommendations that come through those uh, detailed inspections. <clears throat> and I'd also like to note too, that when we're, when, when we're updating the uh, capital forecast, we also uh, meet with the region of Niagara staff and we wanna make sure that we're aligning 
our projects with their projects, uh, primarily where you have large regional projects where there are town um, capital infrastructure components. So if the Niagara region is going to be reconstructing a, a road, uh, if we have uh, underground infrastructure, so we want to make sure that we both are communicating and aligning all that work and that's reflective in the capital forecast. And I think um, lastly here, another really important piece of the capital forecast that uh, we look at when we're updating it is we wanna make sure that it's reflective of our development pressures. So public works staff, uh, we work uh, very closely with our planning staff, planning department, and we want to make sure that any infrastructure needs, capital infrastructure needs, uh, as a result of development are reflected in the capital forecast and the timing of such too. Uh, and again, most of those projects, uh, when we're talking development pressures, they are uh, also identified in the development charge study that we would be referring to and um, would be typically funded by development charges. But that is a, an important piece of the capital forecast is to look at the development pressures. Thanks, Dave. Greg? Thank you, Mike, and uh, good evening, Council. Um, so very similar to what you've heard uh, from Dave and, and Shannon, um, the fire department is very much driven by uh, compliance, if I could use a key term, and meeting public safety uh, service standards. So a lot of uh, the capital items that you'll see really fall into those two categories. There really is no whole lot of discretionary uh, items on a typical uh, capital budget. But just to give you an example, we have a plethora of provincial legislation that we have to comply with. You know, we have uh, some specific occupational health and safety requirements uh, for fire fighting and fire uh, equipment. Uh, we have a whole section 21 um, for compliance for fire service equipment and operations. Uh, under the Fire Protection and Prevention Act, there are some responsibilities for council to set the level of service. And once that's done, there's regulations to, uh, you know, make sure that the proper training and equipment in place to do that. And uh, we also have to abide by fire marshal directives <clears throat> in that regard. There are a number of uh, industry standards we have to comply with. And on the screen there, you'll see a big one that's NFPA 1901, which is probably uh, an inch thick. It's got all kinds of standards for fire apparatus. You know, it's more than just a red truck. You know, we have to go through each and every standard and just make sure we're in, in compliance. Uh, there are some <clears throat> can ULC or Underwriters Laboratories of Canada's uh, safety standards we have to comply with. And there are some fire insurance underwriters requirements. And although we're not uh, obligated legally to comply with them, they are directly related to the uh, fire insurance rating that's used to set fire insurance premiums in the town. So if we don't comply with them to a reasonable level, then you can see some very, very significant increases in uh, fire insurance rates, not only for households, but for commercial properties as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we do have an asset management plan uh, to you know, replace equipment in an efficient manner before you know, the cost of repairs exceeds the uh, value of the equipment that we've been following for a number of years. And similarly, there's some fleet management best practices uh, that we abide by. Um, you'll see on the other side of the screen there, the fire master plan and much like the other master plans uh, mentioned, that really is a five-year snapshot into ways we can improve and enhance the fire service, uh, taking into account uh, projected growth in the area. And there have been a number of recommendations that uh, we've been able to uh, follow over the past few years in that regard. And in terms of the actual determining what gets into the budget or the 10-year capital forecast in any particular year, uh, there, it's really a data-driven decision uh, we look at a number of um, pieces of information, such as you know some of the, the maintenance records. We do weekly, monthly, annual, and compliance testing on all our major equipment. So we review all those records to see uh, if there's something that's uh, costing more than it should or not performing up to the reliability that we need. Uh, after every major incident, we have a post-incident evaluation, and one of the uh, 
uh, topics of discussion in those evaluations is how the equipment and apparatus function. If did it work properly? Are there opportunities for improvement? Uh, we have health and safety committee reports to, you know, to identify any gaps in some of the safety of our equipment. And uh, generally we do uh, try to keep abreast of uh, current developments, you know, as uh, things change, you know, I give the example of uh, drones, you know, nobody ever heard of a drone in, in previous years, but now they're used quite often for a number of uh, different to processes in the fire service and indeed other areas. So we try to keep abreast of that. And lastly, we don't do it in a vacuum. So we make sure we consult with staff. Um, we have uh, regular meetings with our senior officers to make sure we're represented from all four stations in the municipality. And uh, we sit down together, identify equipment needs and prioritize and try to fit them into the budget in sort of a responsible and, and efficient manner. And that uh, really is how we uh, come up with the uh, budget for fire. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Uh, and maybe just to tie it quickly together, uh, Kathleen. Kathleen, I think maybe you're on mute. There we go. There we go. Sorry about that. Too many screens open. Um, so the planning and development department is probably um, a little bit different than some of the other departments. We're actually one of the departments that uh, creates a number of policy documents. Some of those are legislated, such as an official plan. The policy that's prepared does provide direction for the town's budget. We have policy that's set by the province and the region. We implement it in our planning documents. Um, and there was a number of them shown on, on the slide in front of you. Um, this includes our official plan, but then we take the official plan and it's further implemented through various detailed master plans that are prepared by other departments, such as the transportation master plan, tourism strategy, parks, recreation, culture, and master plan, and even our development charge studies. Um, you know, policy is constantly evolving and changing. You know, as an example, you know, we have development charges, which need to be updated. Um, and, and as well, some of these policy changes do require, you know, specific studies to be completed to implement these policies. So some of the examples of how, you know, our, our official plan sets the direction for capital budget include things like um, we have a parks, culture, recreation master plan. So the official plan will designate lands for open space and parks in the official plan. They're then acquired through the development process. So that then in turn requires our community service department to do a design on how that park's going to look and feel um, and then implement that through the construction phase. We have a go secondary plan. So there, this is a major change to this area. So as part of this, there's going to be a lot of, you know, designs that will need to be done um, to upgrade our infrastructure, things like, you know, how our roads are gonna look, how our sidewalks are gonna look, what sort of streetscaping is gonna go in. You have to do designs for that and then eventually do the construction. Um, one of the examples of something that um, is actually underway right now is the, the Jordan redevelopment design. So that was an originally envisioned in a secondary plan. There was a detailed environmental assessment um, done and now we're at the detailed design stage so that we can start construction at some point in the future. We also have the, you know, the Purdom secondary plan. So as part of that, we know that there's servicing upgrades. We know that we're going to need a park. That's going to need, be, need to be designed at some point constructed. We need to have a new fire hall to provide, um, you know, better response time. So that's going to have to be designed and constructed. Um, we have transportation policies in the official plan and we have a new transportation master plan. It has an, a focus on things like active transportation. So this will get implemented through, you know, how you design your road projects, you know, new sidewalks, putting in bike lanes. We also have policies that talk about, you know, our tourism industry and how it's very important for economic development in, in our community. So things like improved signage and gateways, that's one of the ways that we can promote our tourism industry as well. 
you know, we're doing improvements to our rural road network as part of our capital budget. And, and a lot of these improvements are required to support our tourism industry. We also have urban design policies, which provide some direction for the design of these projects. Um, so as well, it's, it, this was also touched on um, our anticipated growth. So our official plan identifies the growth that we're expected um, to happen in the future. So you've got a plan for that growth to look at things like your services, your sidewalks, your trails, your facilities, your parks, and you know what needs to be updated, what needs to be improved to accommodate the growth. If we look at the operating side of the budget, growth also means that there will be say more sidewalks, more roads, more trees to be planted, more parks to be improved, more open spaces, more trails, all those things have to be maintained. So this is, these are kind of examples of how, if you, you look, you start at the policy context, you, then you then take those, do detailed studies. And then at some point, you know, you're doing your designs and you're doing the construction. So it's the policies providing the direction for all of our budget processes. Thanks very much, Kathleen. So council at the end of the day, I mean, you know, I think it's important to hear from, from staff kind of what the, the data, the reports and the evidence uh, that goes into uh, all the work we provide. So thanks to our, our senior staff for, for sharing that information. Next slide. One of the things we've heard, uh, I think loud and clear from council is, um, let's look at some new capital worksheets. Uh, let's clearly lay out uh, what the project is, uh, the details of the project, um, the justification, a little bit of things that we would wanna find in typical business cases. Uh, simply how the project's going to be funded and, and and a lot more visuals, a map, what's it look like, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, here is what we're proposing for those capital budget sheets. They will look different than what you've seen in the past. Uh, we're going to try to simplify where we can. And as I said, add those visual aids. So uh, if council does have suggestions at the end of our presentation, uh, please do uh, share those with staff in terms of uh, if this is capturing a little bit about what you're thinking. We have tried to correlate these to our infrastructure service groups and the various asset management categories and then tie them back to the strategic plan. So just uh, quickly closing up on, on, uh, on this particular phase, uh, as council knows, there's two parts of, uh, of an overall budget operating, which we will get into more so covers the day-to-day -day operations and capital, uh, which really is a lot in a lot of ways um, uh, those large expenditures, uh, sometimes those irregular things that often occur, uh, and uh, the capital assets that we need to preserve, re rehabilitate, renovate, and, and renew, uh, and sometimes construct brand new. So we highlighted a little bit about um, just the engagement, the informing, the debate, and the approving. Uh, just a couple of few, a couple of key points here. Uh, we are by no means going to uh, seek to delay approval till mid 2021. That is though the provincial uh, timeline uh, that we are working towards. Uh, we will have council uh, the pertinent information uh, with enough time for you to review it and make informed decisions. Um, uh, I think we've always said, and, and council knows this, and you've made this one of your tenants and principles, uh, approving the capital budget before the end of the year so that we can begin the best, the procurement process. Uh, and secure pricing where possible. Uh, and I think we continue to move to that. Uh, uh, while council, I think, wants to know the overall impact, we continue to move to, to have the capital as short up and as specific as, as possible. Uh, and giving, I think, the ongoing pandemic, just that flexibility piece will remain important for us all. So communicating here, I think Paul shared this, so I'll, I'll just quickly uh, go over this. Next slide, Paul. Um, a little bit about kind of, you know, decision making and, and property taxes. Uh, as council will know, um, the town uh, is the one that uh, communicates uh, on behalf of taxes uh, to our residents. Uh, so that includes the educational tax uh, increase or not, the regional tax increase uh, and uh, the local tax increase. Uh, there are four annual installments uh, and so uh, that's an important part. We try to tie, correlate some of our communication to that. And often when we hear from residents, it is at those particular times. Um, and uh, for tenants, a portion of rent does go towards paying the property taxes. So I think we're always trying to be cognizant of the various classifications in our community and how we address 
those particular cases. Uh, and just at the bottom there, some of the factors that, that determine um, what an individual pays uh, in terms of property taxes and those rates. So part of it's the annual budgetary increase, of course, MPAC, which we often hear a lot about, uh, and uh, taxes and tax policy set by the region. So again, a little bit of a, a kind of trip down um, uh, the process uh, in terms of how they're calculated. Again, our property taxes and assessed value of the property by MPAC, the local tax rate, uh, add in the regional tax rate, the education tax rate, uh, which is set by the province. And in a particular area, if there is a business improvement area, uh, there's also that BIA rate that's often added. So what does growth mean? We spend a lot of time uh, on growth uh, and we are going to be uh, sharing with council a lot more on growth. Uh, but uh, I'll take you a little bit to this slide uh, in terms of projected uh, growth and, and what our growth uh, revenues will look like. Uh, I think what we need to do here is, uh, is also overlay a number of other uh, decision points and, and charts for council so that you can see what does growth mean from a revenue standpoint? What does it mean from an extended expenditure standpoint, as I said? And what does it mean for us to be able to accomplish the potential growth you're going to see over the next two to three years from how we apportion staff time uh, and, and the appropriate staffing uh, to do this sort of work? So. A little bit of, so, of the sources of revenue. Uh, some of that is um, uh, a house that was recently built on previously uh, assessed or vacant land that often impacts our growth revenue. Uh, new business uh, or an expansion to a business, renovations and improvements. Uh, these are all things that often uh, find their way into the calculation uh, and, uh, and how assessment occurs and increases uh, the amount of growth revenue. Next slide. Uh, so I think one of the key points on that previous slide is that MPAC will come and visit. Uh, They're doing a bit of a traveling roadshow with all municipalities. So in 2021, they will be uh, in front of uh, council, I think highlighting uh, what they've experienced during COVID, what that means for future reassessments uh, and what we can expect. So this is an important slide. It, it really, I think uh, for, from a staff perspective uh, is here to See if we've captured the feedback uh, on what we heard from individual members of council on priorities. Uh, as I said, we'll be coming back with a 10 year capital forecast uh, for the next meeting. Um, but our, we did have ward meetings, uh, and in those ward meetings, um, I think you know some of the things we've heard here that I've tried to capture and we've tried to capture include when we're looking at our capital forecast, uh, making sure projects that are a little later on, uh, we have an inflationary index built into that. Uh, the bundling of projects so uh, we we do have uh, some economies of scales that can be realized but also when we're thinking about our residents and our taxpayers how do we inconvenience them less uh, and so is there bundling of projects on streets that sometimes intersect one another including maps showing proposed infrastructure road work things that uh, i know director graham uh, does every year but we heard that loud and clear again uh, some of the concerns council highlighted uh, where are we at with regional projects and regional funding on projects that are of a joint nature? Uh, delays could cause problems with costs due to current economic climate. Uh, and residents are facing tough financial times. Uh, you know, they're looking at decisions in terms of where they put their own money uh, and so a minimal levy impact. Uh, specific projects, we did hear about continued investment on our road upgrades and our road upgrade projects. We heard about getting parks done and park projects. We heard about the importance of sidewalk works and continuing to put sidewalks in where and if possible, so that uh, both from an active transportation standpoint and just a people movement standpoint, people can move safely across and, and around the community. Uh, that expectation we're hearing loud and clear. Community lighting, so in certain areas where we, uh, where we want to add lights, uh, is there low cost effective ways to do that? Uh, we've heard that and we've had some work uh, that, that definitely we're hearing that from Ward 1, a number of the other wards as well. Uh, and truck traffic, uh, speed mitigation strategies, uh, everything from speed bumps to um, other sorts of uh, uh, innovative and cost-effective ways of at looking at and mitigating speed and traffic. We spend a lot of time uh, on our special projects and we actually segmented them out 
uh, and I uh, appreciate it. And I think the senior leadership team appreciated the conversation we had on these future special projects. Uh, we we parsed them out because I think each each of them in and of themselves is a is a massive endeavor. But also we often get asked, are we thinking of these decisions? Are we thinking of these projects in our other decision making uh, conversations and in the whole decision making matrix uh, that we go through as a as a as a senior team? Uh, and the simple answer to that is yes. Uh, and so I think highlighting them for council though to see the importance of each of those and going through them in our 10 year capital conversations was also important. So uh, by no means is there not others that could be added to this list, um, but these are things that uh, we will bring to you uh, when we have a, a more defined timeline on when they occur and what is the capital ask uh, that we will likely see in these cases. And so some of these we may come to you mid year, some of them more than likely will be in future years. So shoreline protection, prudums, the gold precinct, uh, all things kind of Vineland and the Vineland, Victoria King intersection and that connectivity there. Of course, truck traffic, uh, the BDSS precinct and our Vineland uh, multi-agency facility. So um, questions, comments, clarity. I think as you can see, we've, we've laid out a detailed process for, for you that staff have been using to develop the budget council. I think thankfully we're starting from a good point, given the health of our reserves, our low debt to revenue ratio. Uh, so it is important, I think, as we move forward uh, that we discuss uh, these sorts of things that we discussed and engage the community. Uh, and we look forward to your comments tonight uh, and look forward to coming back uh, in the next few weeks with our 10-year capital forecast. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. CAO. And uh, again, I want to thank you for uh, your time and dedication on this, uh, as well as uh, the contributions of your staff and all the, the heads of the department, uh, not only tonight in your presentation, but in the uh, the hours and, and the amount of time that have gone into putting this uh, forward. I know in a lot of ways, it's like catching a butterfly by while you're being uh, chased by a swarm of bees. So uh, I know it's not an easy process, but uh, it's something that uh, obviously uh, will get done uh, with uh, expediency and with a great deal of care and concern. So I'm thank going for, to now. Thank oh. you for that visual, Mr. Chair. <laughs> hey, I, I'm, I'm nothing if not a good person with analogies. Um, so I'm gonna open it up to uh, members of council if you have any questions or comments and I'm going to rely on my clerk, um, uh, Ms. Kirkalos uh, to help uh, uh, be the uh, uh, the conduit for uh, whom is on uh, on deck. And I see uh, my vice chair, Councillor Pachariva is up first. So Councillor Pachariva. Thank you, Chair Russell. And um, Mike and staff, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, well thought out, very thorough. Um, going, to, uh, going to go back to uh, page 1415. So showing our long-term borrowing levels and showing our reserve and reserve fund balance. Um, might it, and, and you know, reserves are set aside for uh, rainy days. So I would say we're in the midst of a monsoon right now. So um, might it be prudent to maximize the use of reserves this year um, in doing our budget? So not only the dedicated reserves, but the obligatory reserves to, to get the work done. We, we received that letter from uh, the heavy construction industry about uh, municipality government's role of, of stimulating the economy through capital works. Um, so the possibility of doing that. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I mean, I, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with the council. I think we are in a very good financial position. I think uh, one of the tenets of good long-term financial sustainability is always putting money into reserves and saving uh, and mm -hmm. saving for a rainy day. I think we do that personally. We do that when we're running organizations. Uh, and so I think maximizing our, our reserve, um, our reserves and our reserve funds uh, in a way that uh, maintains that trajectory of continued investment, but also minimizes impact, uh, I think what will, will absolutely be a, a tenant that we will be bringing forward to council, a principle that we'll be bringing forward to council. Okay, terrific. Um, and I've got two more, if I may, Chair Russell. Floor is yours. Okay, fantastical. 
Um, with respect to the um, 10 year capital forecast and the sheets that we're going to see. Um, and, and we made a, we made a, um, I thought we made a policy that uh, when we're doing, uh, and you pointed it out, Mr. Kirkopoulos, that, that when we're doing um, construction works, capital works, that, that we would do things over one year rather than two years to uh, stop the interruption to neighborhoods. So, it, and this had became a, a, you know, a kind of a, a pillar of us going forward, but then this year and in the, um, you know, in the capital sheets from last year, the, the stencil freeze in neighborhood works um, were done over two years and it has caused a lot of consternation to that neighborhood. So want to make sure if we're going to do that, that that's highlighted in some way, shape or form. Uh, it was in little print. I got to admit, I missed it. But you know, uh, moving away from that and then coming back, I don't, I don't want to see that. And 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 then, two, we had talked, and I had brought it up last year about climate change. If we're serious about climate change, um, to have a notation in these capital worksheet, whether it's a leaf, something like that, that says, okay, this is. We're doing this as, as part of a climate change adaptation plan and also maybe a notation too. Oh, and you've got that and on how it fits into the master plan. So, okay, terrific. So, yeah, Mr. Chair, I mean, all, all good comments, Councillor. Um, I agree, not more wording, but clearer wording. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think um, I think that's important and, and definitely on the climate change side. Um, we will be sure uh, that we, we make that correlation. I see Director Graham making uh, detailed notes there. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Thanks, Chair Russell. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I don't see anybody else uh, immediately in the queue, so I, uh, I'm just going to throw a couple of questions in there to keep things lively. Um, if we don't mind going back uh, to that page 1415, uh, kind of along the same lines as the debt versus reserves, I think my vice chair uh, made a very good point about uh, us being in a potential monsoon um, and uh, that uh, the ability to dip into reserves, uh, this would be the time and it'd be apropos. Uh, my question is, uh, we had a chart that showed our debt uh, as a dollar amount and then we had a following chart, uh, this one, uh, page 15 that has the reserves as a percentage. Is there any way we can get a ratio of debt to reserves so that we can get a little apples to apples comparison just to find out exactly uh, how the two match up? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I, absolutely. I think you know we will endeavor to take this slide, which was a regional slide through KPMG uh, and maybe in our own way, incorporate that and overlay that into a, a slide that allows you to see those both overlaid. Okay, thank you, Mr. CAO. Um, one follow-up question. Um, we have, if you mind going back to page 12, um, where we're, we are recorded at about a, a 315 uh, growth rate uh, number of residents or number of households um, over the next five years on an average yearly basis. Um, what would the expected increase uh, in revenue? I know that there was a, a chart a little later on which showed some percentages. Is that what would be attributed to those increases? About a I think it was about a 3% increase in 2019 uh, and kind of going up uh, over the next few years. Is that uh, that correlation? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, it would be. Uh, right there. So I think, yeah, so this would be kind of what that looks like on a percentage basis. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. CAO. And I see uh, Councillor McPherson on deck. So Mr. McPherson, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm going to stop my video just so that uh, I don't uh, start slurring my words, okay? So uh, thank you very much, uh, Mike and, and senior staff for that uh, presentation. It was uh, certainly very enlightening and uh, it's always interesting uh, to see where uh, what drives all the numbers. So a uh, couple of comments. Uh, make uh, very interested in the residential growth piece uh, as long as well as the non-residential growth piece uh, and uh, and seeing uh, certainly those financials coming forward I expect that we're going to 
to turn those number of units on that slide into financials to, uh, to give us an indication of what, what kind of, um, what kind of net added dollars, I will say, net added dollars we will see as a result. The one comment I would have on the non-residential growth is, it looks like we have a very optimistic, very consistent uh, forecast over the next four years. It, 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 hasn't, it hasn't presented itself that way in the previous four years, but the number is, are you not hearing me? No, we can hear you, Councilor. Okay. okay, I'm just seeing Kathleen waving her hand, but you know, it just it just uh, looks like um, you know it's it's uh, you know I guess I, I I'd like to know where those numbers are coming from. As far as um, the uh, the the big projects, let's say the BDSS, the pen, you know, the, the Vineland multi-use facility, all of that long list of items. You know, I wonder if we uh, don't need to see a document showing to the best of our ability, uh, a forecast of uh, those major projects, uh, their estimated cost, uh, and, and again, I emphasize forecast, so an estimate of their cost, the year that they uh, are forecasted to start or, or hit, along with um, a forecast of the funding and what, what we're thinking as far as funding goes. And, and you know, again, I emphasize forecast. I know that you know, this is not easy. It's a bit crystal ballish, but I think it's in our best interest to lay those, I, those items out since they are such big hitters that if we can see, you know, over the course of the next five, six years, this is when we, when we think this is going to uh, start or impact us and really start looking at that long-term borrowing in that light that we are um, going to move from number four to number six or number, you know, whatever it is, as a result of some pretty significant investment uh, long-term. So those, that, that's one, an, an item that, that I'm putting out there suggesting. Uh, and finally, uh, well, two more things. Finally, uh, I appreciate, very much appreciate information on reserves to revenues ratio. You know, I've, I've, uh, I've often wondered, you know, how are we sitting as far as our revenues, or, sorry, our ratio, or, sorry, our reserves are concerned. And, and I think it shows a very nice comparison with our neighbor municipalities uh, and more importantly, that the financial health that we're, uh, we're sitting in right now as far as uh, reserves are concerned. So very much appreciate that. The, the last thing uh, I, I put out there, uh, and this, this, is, this is probably again forward looking and it, and it may not be 2021, but I think it's important to, to consider when we are thinking about uh, the budget for 2021 is the potential impact of the impact assessment coming. And if we uh, can uh, work with the impact folks or look at previous, uh, previous uh, increases that we have experienced over the, the last, I don't know how many years, 10, 15 years, what are those increases, uh, you know, what do they look like? And if we could put that number onto our number, I believe that uh, it's, it's coming. We expect it maybe uh, 2021 or, or more likely 2022. So looking 2022 and beyond, how much more revenue are we looking at gaining as a result of the impact assessment, which many of us are thinking is going to be pretty significant. So those are uh, just generally some, some thoughts as a result of, of your presentation. And um, you know, put it up back to you, Mr. Chair, if there's uh, any comments that staff would like to make. 
Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor. I see uh, Director Dale has uh, her hand up, uh, maybe to uh, provide some further insight. Director Dale. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, so I think I can probably answer the question about the new commercial industrial and industrial floor area. The reason, you know, you see the up and down up to, say, August 31st, 2020, is those are based on actual. When we get into the the latter years, what we did is we relied on the information that was um, provided through our development charges study. So the consultants that um, did our development charge study, they do look at they also look at growth, both residential and non-residential growth. So those figures are from the development charges study. Okay, thank you, Director Dale. And I see our CAO would also like to make a further comment. Uh, three, Mr. Chair, I think just on the special projects piece, I think one of the things that the councillor highlighted is absolutely uh, what, what we want to be doing, what I want to be doing with, uh, with our team. And that is coming back and putting a program of sorts around special projects. And I think sharing with council you know, when is it coming? What's it look like? Uh, you know, what are the key pieces of it? Uh, and where, where where possible, I think doing a little bit of that forecasting and crystal balling, Councillor, in terms of what we think the year will be. So I think it's a great idea, definitely something that we can uh, that we can look at. Okay, thank you, Mr. CAO. Um, one thing I just want to note, and again, I know it's likely to come up uh, in one of the future meetings. Um, it's just more along the lines of, uh, again, how that uh, Town of Lincoln tax bill is kind of split up where the region takes uh, the majority of the share. Uh, I believe we get about a third and uh, the school board gets a, about 15%. So well, one question I have, and it, it's probably very, very early to, to find this information out, but just to put it on the radar for down the road, is do we have any indication yet of what uh, that school board um, potential cost is going to be uh, given what's happening with COVID and some of the uh, uh, the budgetary constraints or budgetary increases we're seeing at schools, uh, and I'm sure that the province obviously is is helping out quite a bit with that uh, through some of their funding. But I'm just wondering if uh, we're expecting or have heard anything yet about a potential increase in that amount, because I know it's been pretty static uh, the last few years, at least the last couple of years I've been around. So, any thoughts on that, uh, Terry? I mean, I think from what we've heard is, you know, yes, you're right, Council. The province sets that rate. Um, uh, have we heard anything? I, I don't believe there's an update yet, um, but Terry, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's correct. The uh, The province sets it on an annual basis and they set the rate itself that gets applied to people's property assessment. We just, I haven't heard an update when it's coming out. We just have to wait for them. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. To, to you, Mr. Chair, I, I think AMO and, and a number of the other bodies that are advocating for uh, for uh, on behalf of municipalities are hoping once again that uh, and advocating that uh, it doesn't go up like past years, but you're right, COVID uh, and the investment the provincial government's made in uh, made in schools may put them in a, in, in, a, in a position where they would see a small increase, but I, I would say, I think our expectation is that it won't go up, just cognizant of where we're at right now and the challenges that as, as council has highlighted that the taxpayer is feeling, this would just, you know, add to that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. CAO. Uh, seeing no other hands, oh, uh, I see uh, our Deputy Mayor, Councillor Mikulik has uh, thrown up his hand. So Deputy Mayor, please, your thoughts. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Russell. I thought your opening speech was terrific. Um, you know, I thought you did a, a fine job with that. Thank you, Mr. CAO, for your uh, opening comments and as well to staff for explaining, um, you know, the system and the process, how it works. Um, have a, you know, a question to our CEO and to staff when we're drawing up these budgets, like what, what are we hoping, like how do we determine that increase? Like I saw that there was a, a note of inflationary dis, uh, index. Um, was it 1.9? Like I saw that thrown, uh, that number, uh, noted. Um, the one thing I want to, a comment that I want to make is, is just, I, I, I'm not sure if many of the residents are receiving a raise that is equal to the uh, inflationary dis, uh, index. I just want uh, staff and, uh, you know, the rest of council to know that, uh, you know, we're not all getting raises. We're, you know, we want to keep things affordable uh, within the town. And 
Councillor McPherson touched upon it a little bit with regards to the impact on the, I believe it was page number 25. It's pretty, in my mind, in my eyes, from what I can see, it's basically the assessed value of your home times the set town set mill rate, or, you know, and that equals the amount of property taxes that you pay. Um, question I have is because we don't know what the potential impact increases are, do we take into, do we take those increases in real estate values into consideration when we're trying to determine what our hoped for increase or what our um, expected increase is? Is it a fluid, can it be adjusted? Let's say that we approve an X amount increase and then we find out, whoops, um, it, it, values of the homes have gone up 5.8% and then all of a sudden the increase to the taxpayer is more than perhaps we even thought. I'm not sure if this is a question staff can comment to at this time or um, so through, through you, Mr. Chair, I think there's there's a lot to maybe unpack in that. And, and let me, you know, I think let me start with uh, your comment, Councillor, as it relates specifically to uh, to the to the CPI that we included in there. Um, I, you know, your, your reference, I think us throwing it in there uh, as a barometer for what a tax increase would be. I, I want to, I think, just be clear that that's not our intention in putting that number in there. Oftentimes, we're asked. Um, what does it cost to do the work we need to do or, or purchase the products we need to purchase? Uh, and oftentimes I think CPI is one of those standard uh, methodologies or measurements that we use that reflects uh, what people have to pay for for the exact same services in the subsequent year. Uh, and so I think that that's really that number. By no means am I suggesting that should be the number we seek to increase this year. Uh, I think council will have to look at everything we put in front of you uh, and make those decisions and, and I think have that deliberation. Uh, as it relates specifically to um, to our taxes and do we take MPAC into consideration when looking at what we need? Uh, I think MPAC is always, and what residents pay because their home value goes up, uh, is something that we're always looking at from the perspective of uh, an affordability conversation. However, from a municipal perspective, uh, we're responsible for delivering X services uh, to the community uh, and the cost of doing X services. Uh, and so, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it that it's a direct correlation or a direct input into how we make decisions, but it is something that we keep top of mind. Um, it is something that we don't know. Uh, we don't know, like in 2020 or 2021, there'll be a further freeze. Uh, I suspect at some point uh, that will be a decision that the provincial government makes. Uh, and so I think where possible, we do try to look at that, but by no means are we looking at that and saying, as a result of impact going up by X, we should see a decrease or not invest in certain services. So not, not, a, not a direct kind of apples to apples um, kind of correlation for us as staff as we look to develop budgets. But as I will say, um, you know, we continue to look at affordability and in the context of affordability, of course, impact weighs into that. So we do have supplementary bills that go out uh, that that budget and revenues. Uh, so, you know, I think we're we're always fluid, but uh, the level of fluidity uh, is not such that uh, we can adjust the, on the fly because impact, you know, happens to go up or impact happens to be larger than we thought. Thank you for that response, Mr. CAO. The reason why I asked is because we are entering a reassessment period and this this is bringing uncertainty um, myself and I'm sure many many included so uh, that's that's why I bring that up it, it's 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 a building it, it's a it's a it's a uh, it's a double whammy it, it could be possibly be a double whammy which I would not like to see um, especially during these times um, when uh, you know money is tight and uh, I think similar to the way households are um, taking a look at their finances and how they're and and their spending I you know I'm, I'm certainly hoping that we as a municipality are doing the same 
uh, cognizant, recognizing the immediate needs as well as the future needs and wants, uh, you know, that, that, that we have before us that uh, we'd like to see accomplished. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And again, I think it was a very good point uh, for us to be cognizant of uh, as we as we go forward. It's not necessarily something that we, we have our, in our control, but it's definitely something that we should have uh, in the ether of uh, when we are making these decisions. So um, I'm going to then go to Madam Mayor, Mayor Easton, for a word. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, the quality of the information, including your presentation, Mr. Chairman, very uh, insightful. Um, I, I um, also have um, some um, perspective on how I think this, this budget should go forward. I'm not um, really a big fan, as you all know, of the eraser method. And so I've been sharing with the CAO uh, my concerns about the innovative um, um, methodology that is going to support, as you say, Mr. Chairman, the marginalized. And so I am looking at those things that fall into the category of healthy communities and all the ways that um, our processes are going to support people. And there are um, some are direct and some are indirect. And, and so I'm, I'm going to be looking for evidence of all of those. Uh, I'm very pleased to see that um, we are looking at um, growth, but in a way that um, really reflects what the realism is about that growth, how it will impact our reserves, how it will impact our future, um, our future debt if we choose to go that route in some cases. We are in a very healthy position and there's many ways that we could look at using the money that's available to us without being too um, cavalier um, to lift the load. No, no question about it. Um, and so I, I appreciate many of the comments that have been made about long-term borrowing and the reserve balances and the rainy day, because this, if this isn't the rainy day, I'm not sure it would be. Um, and I think, um, Councillor Russell, your Chair Russell, your, your suggestion about the chart showing debt to reserves is one that will probably make us look very favorable, um, but not, I don't think you were ex expressing for a moment that you, we should be falling back on our laurels. We have done some very good management, um, but we have had um, some good uh, tax increases as well. Um, I guess in retrospect, um, all these things have come together at the best time. I'm very pleased that Councillor McPherson has been paying attention to my um, um, desire and expressions around financial sustainability. And I, I think normally, maybe we wouldn't, and maybe this is a, this is a question that I would I would have for Mr. CAO. Maybe financial sustainability in itself is not something that is desirable to begin to look at um, as part of a budget. Um, but with our growth, um, as uh, Councilor McPherson was saying, you know what what is that that um, that picture? And I have, I've had this vision for a long time of this, of, of the growth. What is that net growth? How much money is coming in? Where is that money going to be applied? And what's going to be left over to put into, into reserves? Because I fear that if we don't have that big picture, that we could find ourselves in another circumstance without a pandemic, spending too much money. And so now, and we don't want to do that either, because this is a, these are in some ways the growth, these are halcyon days in terms of the growth with this other pressure coming at us from the side. And so we have to be very careful for a whole variety of reasons. And so I'll, I will re, I feel that's an extremely important um, chart that we need to see. Um, I'm afraid, um, Councillor Mik Mikulik, Deputy Mayor Mikulik, that the impact situation is, um, is something that's going to have to find its own level. Um, I think the assessments, uh, these assessments are, um, are able to be um, adjusted according to policy that we have absolutely no control over at all. 
And in fact, some of the rationale in some areas, and I'll use the aggregate lands as an example, which is being contested, um, where there are arbitrary, there's arbitrariness to the reasons why aggregate land is, um, is assessed much lower than industrial land and much lower than residential land. So our taxpayers carry a burden there, and I think that needs to be adjusted. And I'm certainly doing my part to, to work with that with my per, um, provincial counterparts. But there is a delivery of service that people expect. And I think that, you know, I go back then to those who are most vulnerable. What are the innovations? Because I say the eraser is of no interest to me. We have very talented staff as we all know. And so I'm looking for many other solutions. If we get to a point where that's our only solution that we have to cut service, I, we won't have any trouble doing that. But I think there is an expectation at the moment. And as time goes by, I think we're going to hear from a lot of people what their intentions are and what their sentiments are around that. Um, but overall, I think this was an excellent start. I'm not at all surprised by the quality of what we've received. Um, and um, the staff have certainly given us the, a, a terrific basis from which to begin our, our deliberations. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, I'll, again, I'll echo those thoughts about uh, the excellence of but not only the discussion tonight, but the presentation uh, itself and the work that's gone into it. Um, and I, I'm very happy to hear uh, throughout all the comments and even just uh, some of the commentary uh, uh, of the steering committee that was that was brought to, to this point um, about the openness about finding solutions and finding ways to to minimize that impact on our residents, uh, whatever they might be leaving nothing, uh, no stone unturned, leaving nothing off the table to make sure that uh, we can deliver uh, the, the essential services that we are used to delivering and that high quality, um, but uh, with this minimal impact on the pocketbook, uh, just given this uh, short-term effect. So uh, I see uh, our CAO has his hand up for further commentary. Through, through you, Mr. Chair, I think just to the mayor's comment, but generally I think to all of council, uh, all, all good points that have raised, I think we're gonna look forward to using the comments that we heard, uh, the principles and all those of council and the development of the budget. And so I agree with all of council, this is a balancing act. Uh, but it's one that that's uh, that, that's an act that we balance based on significant data. So we will ensure we are especially diligent through this uh, process. And uh, I, I want council to know we do take the task seriously. I think you know that. Uh, I know you you all do. Uh, and so I, I thank council for your comments tonight and suggestions. And uh, we'll be in front of you in a few weeks with uh, with more information. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cao. Um, seeing no further hands uh, coming into the queue, um, there being no further discussion, I have uh, a motion uh, moved by Mayor Easton to receive and file as information the presentation provided by staff regarding capital forecast introduction. I will now, now ask the clerk to call the vote. Thank you. Just take your mics off mute and I'll call your names. Councillor Bernays, Mark Thompson, Councillor McPherson. I'll come back to Councillor McPherson. Councillor Micklin? Yes. Oh, that was Councillor McPherson. <laughs> em emphatically. <laughs> I was very excited, yes. yes. <laughs> Councillor Micklin? Yes, too. Uh... Thank you. Councillor Pachariva? Yes. Councillor Reimer? Yes. Councillor Regina? Yes. Councillor Russell? Yes. Councillor Timmers? Yes. Mary Easton? Yes. And that carries. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, we have no confidential items this evening. Do we have any committee remarks? Seeing none, um, just one uh, further comment. I wanna thank everybody for their participation tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank any residents that are still hanging on and watching this on our YouTube uh, channel. Um, and as our EDO, Paul DeAnne had mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, we do appreciate your engagement. So if you have any questions or concerns about this uh, program or about any further production uh, of our budget process, please reach out to your counselors and uh, give them uh, your thoughts uh, at your leisure. We appreciate every comment and concern. Um, there being no further business, I call this meeting adjourned at 7.34 p.m. Everyone have a great night. Thank you.
Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good night.